Chapter 7, Part 3 of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland, Chapter 7. The Nightland, Part 3. Now I walked six hours, and did stop a little to eat and drink, and went on again. And it was in this second third of the day that I saw afar to my right two strange and wondrous men, and they did shine as they had been made of a pale mist, and they came anigh going very swift, and did seem as that they were maybe forty feet high, yet having no thickness. And I hid downward into the moss-bushes, and they passed me so quiet as a cloud of this day might go, and did appear to be, if I did guess, but an hundred fathoms off, yet was this no sure thing, for their position had no more surety than shall a rainbow have in this age. And so they were gone onward into the night, and did seem to come out of the north, and they did appear not to wot of me, and whether they were harmful I know not, for they harmed not me. And I lay there in the moss-bushes until they were well gone away, and I had belief that they must be those same mist-men that were told of in certain of the olden records, but were never seen anigh to the pyramid. Though I had thought, odd times, to see men as of mist through the great spy-glass when I was within the tower of observation, but they were always a mighty way off, and some would say it was but a bright vapour that did move, yet would others be in doubt, and so it is ever in such matters. And here let me take chance to say how that it is a hard thing to speak of such happenings to men of this age, and to make the truth proper unto them, and because of this oft am I tempted to say no word upon many things that I did see, yet must I tell my tale, or suffer from the weight of it within me. And so shall you hark to me, and give me your sympathy and human understanding. And concerning these mist-men, I have wondered oft whether they were the visible shape of some of those many forces that were abroad in the nightland, for they did truly seem to me as that a thing of strange life were half shown to my human eyes. Yet I do not know, and am but telling of my natural thoughts and ponderings. Now, as I did say, those mist-men were never seen nigh unto the pyramid, and were, as I did hint, always so far off that they were half given over to the fables of the olden days, in the beliefs of the peoples of the mighty redoubt, and set about with an halo of unrealness, for none within the great pyramid had ever beheld them with surety. And because that now I saw them anigh to me, it was borne in afresh upon my spirit how greatly I had wandered away, and how that I stood afar in the lonesomeness of that land of night as it had been that a man of this age did wander amid the stars, and perceive a great comet to go by him very close. For then he should know in his heart how that he was far off in the void. And this I do say to you, that you may know somewhat of the emotions of my heart in that moment. Yet presently I shook free of my melancholy and lonesomeness, and rose up out of the moss-bushes, and went onward and, as ever, I thought much upon the maid that I did search for, yet strove to think quietly concerning her state, else should I have turned to running and wrecked my body before that I had gone any great way. And that day I passed seven large fire-holes, and two that were small, and always I came softly unto them, for there were oft living things about the warmth and at the sixth fire-hole I did see that which I did think to be a great man that did sit to the fire with monstrous knees drawn upward unto his chin. And the nose was great and bent downward, and the eyes very large, and did shine with the light from the fire-hole, and moved, watching, always this way and that, so that the white parts did show, now this side and now that. But it was not properly a man." and I went away very quiet from that place, and looked oft backward, until that I was sure of safety, for it was a very horrid monster, and had that place to be for a lair, as I did judge from the smell thereof. 
and when the eighteenth hour was come I looked about for a safe place to my sleep, and I kept away now from the fire-holes, for I did always find them more life there. Yet when I came to my rest I was lacking of warmth by reason of this care, and could scarce sleep at all because that I was so cold, yet managed something of slumber after a while, but woke very stiff and was glad to beat my hands and bestir myself that I should come to some warmth of life. And after that I had eat and drunk, I put my gear upon me and took the discos in my hand and went forward again upon my journey. And here I should tell you that I was come soon unto the northwest border of the plain of blue fire. And presently I was but a little way off from it, and did go direct to the north, so that the plain was always upon my right. Now this plain was a strange and fearsome place, as you shall see. For it was as that a blue void did rise upward from the earth in all the country of that plain. For surely the plain did not lumber with flame, but was hid with a strange and inburning light, as of a shining atmosphere of a cold blue color. And it did throw no sure light upon the nightland, as had seemed proper but was a very dreadful, cold shining, as of a luminous and blue void. And the moss-bushes grew nigh to the edge of the plain, and did show to me black and strange against that horrid gloom of light. And you shall know that I could not see into the plain, for it was as that the cold blue light was a void that swallowed all within it, and gave no power to the eye that aught should be perceived, and it stood between me and the mighty pyramid, and I could nowise see a cross. And I know not whether I do make all this matter clear unto you, for surely it is no easy task. And presently I had gone very quiet upon my hands and knees through the moss-bushes, and I came near upon the edge of the plain, and hid there in a clump of the moss-bush, and peered forth and harked. And I heard constant voices that did call to one another across the plain, as it were that strange peoples of spirits did wander within that blue shining, and did make a calling one to the other, and were all hid and held apart. And surely I could see naught, and did judge, as I have writ, that they likewise went blindly. And truly is this a strange matter to set out, and easy to think on with doubt. Yet as I did see, so have I told, for in verity there were surely hidden peoples of spirits scattered and lost afar upon that improper plain. And you shall judge that I kept safe hid, for whether this might have any natural explaining, or whether it was a matter that did go utter beyond knowledge of man, I did not know, for surely in that strange land it did like to be in horrid danger in any case, and whether of some monstrous creatures, or of the evil forces of the land, I did wisely to be away and for two days I did make a safe coasting of the plain of blue fire, and did keep well off, maybe two great miles, among the moss-bushes. And I made a very good speed through the darkness, and at the eighteenth hour of each journey I made a place for my slumber, and the first I did manage under a thick bush, but the second was high upon the ledge of a rock that grew upward in the night amid the bushes. And save that I was bitter cold, there did no harm come to me and in all that time of journeying I had no sight of the mighty pyramid, for the blind shining of the plain of blue fire was ever between. Now there have been certain little matters in my journey beside the plain of blue fire which I have not set down, for they were of no account, and do but repeat much that I have told before. And indeed there was naught in that part of my journey, save that I did pass nineteen great fire-holes and four small and did observe no life beside any, save about one of the great holes that there was no hollow ground, and here I did happen to see some strange and ugly creatures, so big as my head, that did have a look of the scorpion of this age, but proportioned more squat and thick. Yet though they were not to remark upon in that land, they had been but woeful bedmates to any man, as you may think." and you shall know how it gave a rest to my spirit, that I did go so long with no trouble of the monsters of the night, or the evil forces thereof, 
and I grew bolder to my journeying, and made ever a greater speed of going, and it was like that I took presently a less heed for my safety, which was a wrong and foolish state. Yet there came no harm unto me in all that part of my travel. Then it was in the sixteenth hour of the third day of my journey beside the plain, that I did come out beyond the end of it, and had fresh sight of the mighty pyramid afar in the night upon my right. And I stopped there in a bare place among the moss-bushes, and did in a weak moment hold up the discos, so that I make a salute unto the pyramid, mine home, for truly was I so utter glad to behold it once more. And in a little while I was aware that there was a disturbance of the ether of the world all about me, so that it did seem that there had been one at the great spy-glass to watch for my coming into their sight from behind the shining of the plain of blue fire. And it was like that news had gone downward through the cities of the great redoubt, so that they did print the word of it in the hour-slips, and by this there would be many great millions thinking upon me, and a rushing unto the embrasures, that they might spy out at me. Yet I doubt that any glass might perceive me so surely at so great a space, save the power of the great spy-glass in the tower of observation, but the emotion of the millions to reach me. And you shall know that it did seem homely and sweet unto me to hear all about me the shaking of the ether of the world, and to beware that so many did think humanly upon me, and had prayers unto my safety. And it was a strange thing to stand so utter far off in the night, and to look back to that everlasting hill of light that was grown something small by the distance, and to have surety that I was looked upon through the great spy-glass, maybe by the kindly eye of my dear friend the Master Monstruaken, and so keenly that he could, it might be, make almost to guess the look within mine eyes, as I did gaze backward unto that mine home. Yet, though this dear and homely sympathy was a sweet and companionable thing to my heart, it came swift to my thought that I was in a sore danger if they ceased not quickly to think so onely upon me, for surely was I not come over near unto that dreadful house of silence, and well might so much emotion of the millions tell unto the horrid power that dwelt within how that I was even anigh and so shall you see the mixed feelings that came upon me every way. Yet, as it did chance, the ether was quieted in a little, for it did need unity of the millions, being that they were untrained to their spiritual powers, to stir the ether. And so was I more easy of mind, and went forward again upon my way. Now, as it did chance, at the eighteenth hour, I was come to a place where I heard a noise of water, and I went to my left that I might come upon it, and there boiled a hot fountain that went up out of the rock of that place. And the water rose upward in a column, and was maybe so thick as my body. And it fell unto the north, for the water came not up straightly, but did shoot out from the earth unto that way. And I saw the thing plain, for there were many fire-holes all about, as you shall have wotted from my telling and so was there a certain and constant light in that part of the land. And I followed the water that ran from the fountain, and tried it with mine hand, but found it to burn, and so did go further beside it, for presently it should be no hotter than I did need. And it went onward, winding among the moss-bushes, and sent up a constant steam that hung about it, and the steam made a red cloud about the way that it did go, for the lights from the fire-holes made a shining upon it, and so was it a wondrous pretty sight. Now presently I tried the stream again, and found it to be nicely warm, and I sat upon a little rock and took off my foot-gear, that I might bathe my feet, which were gone something tender. Moreover, I did ache to have the sweetness of water about me. And I made that I should bathe my feet, and afterwards find a place among the moss-bushes, and so eat and drink, and have my slumber. Then, as I did sit there beside that warm stream, with my feet dabbled therein, I heard sudden, afar off, the voice of a mighty night-hound, baying in the night, and the sound came from the northwest of the plain of blue fire. And there was afterward a quiet, 
and you shall see me sitting there upon the rock by the side of that smoking river and the steam all about me, and my feet within the lovely warmth of the water, and I very still and frozen with a sudden fear. For it did seem to me, in an instant, that the night-hound might surely be upon the track of my goings. And after that there had passed a little time, the while that I did listen very keen. Lo, there burst out in the night, as it did seem scarce a mile off, the monstrous deep baying of the giant hound. And I knew surely that the brute did track me, and a sick and utter horror did fall upon me, so that I could scarce get my footgear upon me once more. Yet in truth I was not long to the matter, and was to my feet, and did hold the discos ready. And very desperate I was to the heart, for it is ever a fearsome thing to be put in chase, and the worse an hundred times when there is a sure knowledge that a deathly monster doth be the pursuer. Now I did stand there but a moment it did seem, to make an anxious considering how that I might best assure me some chance to live through this swift coming danger. And then did I think upon the stream to use it, and I leapt quick therein, and did run very strong down the middle part, which was nowhere so much as thigh-deep and oft not above mine ankles. And as I did run, there came again the bellow of that dire brute following, and was now, as mine ears did say, scarce the half a mile to my rear. And I did run the stronger, for the dread of the sound, and so maybe for a little minute, and after that time I stopped from mine heavy running and went very wary, that I made no loud splashing for by now the monster brute should be something anigh to that place where I did enter the stream. And I looked round with a constant looking, but did see no surely visible thing, though my fear did shape me and hound from every shadow of the moss-bushes about me. Then in a moment I did hear the great beast, for it bayed but a little way up the stream, as that it had overshot the place where the scent did end. And immediately I sank swiftly into the water, which was there so deep as my knee, and turned upon my belly. And the water surged over my shoulders, for I kept my head above. And so I did look eager and fearful through the steam into the shadows and half-darkness, towards where I did think to see the night-hound. And in a moment I saw it coming, and it was a little vague by reason of the smoke of the river, yet did seem black and monstrous in the gloom and great as a mighty horse. And it went past me at a vast and lumbersome gallop, but I did not see it in that moment, for I dived my head down into the rock of the river-bottom and held downward, until that I was like to burst for sore longing of breath. Then I put upward my head, and took swift and deep breathings, and looked about me, very cautious and fearful, as you can know and I heard the night-hound casting round among the moss-bushes, and it did send up a wild and awesome baying. And I heard the bushes break and smash beneath it, as it did run to and hither. And afterward there was a quiet. Yet I moved not, but stayed there, very low in the water, and did have a thankful heart that it was warm and easy to persist in for I had surely died of a frozen heart, if that it had been cold for by this time you do know even with me how bitter was the chill of the land. Now I had been a while lain thus upon my belly, and heard no sound from the monstrous hound. Yet I ceased not to be full of an horrid unease concerning the great beast, for I did better to know what it did than to have no knowing. And sudden I heard the sound of it, running very swiftly and coming nigh, and it passed me, and did go up the stream, and there was surely a quick stupor upon me, for I ducked not my head under the water, but stayed very still, which, as it did chance, was maybe not such an utter foolishness. For my head did seem in that half-gloom to be, mayhap, no more than a little rock in the water, and I made no move to tell of life. Yet should the hound have smelled me, and that it failed in this matter, doth be a puzzle to me. And as the great night-hound passed me, it tore the earth and the bushes, with the exceeding strength that it put forth to run, and clods of the earth and stones of bigness were cast this way and that by the feet of the hound running. 
and so shall you have a little knowledge of the strength of that beast. And the hound ran on into the distance, and presently I heard it baying in the night. Then I rose and went onward, down the warm stream, and made a strong walking, yet keeping all way to the water, and off did stop a little that I should listen, and always I heard the night-hound a great way off in the night, baying, and seeming that it did surely run to and fro, searching. Now I journeyed thus for twelve hours, and the baying of the hound making search did never cease and I kept always to the water, as I did say, that I should leave no scent unto the hound. And by that twelve weary hours had gone, I found that I was come anigh unto the house of silence, and this put me in great trouble, as you may perceive, for surely had mine whole effort been to the end that I should avoid that house by a great way, yet had the hound driven me thus anear. Now I saw that the small river did go onward, and did make a breach across the road where the silent ones walk, and I determined in my heart that I should leave the water, which was now grown nigh to a bitter cold, in that it was so long upon the face of the land. Yet chiefly did I mind to leave the water, that I should come no more anigh unto that house of silence, for the water did go that way. And I stood a while, and did listen for the baying of the hound but could hear it no more, and did have a surety within me that it was indeed gone from searching for me. Then I came out of the water, and went forward, stooping and creeping among the moss-bushes, going outward to the westward of the north, so that I should go away so quickly as I might from the nearness of the house. Yet, lo, I was gone upon my hands and knees no more than an hundred fathoms, when I did find the moss-bushes to cease to the westward, for a great way, and there to be a great bareness of rock, which, in truth, was much shown thereabout. And I dared not to go outward upon that naked land, for then I had not been hid by the moss-bushes, but had stood plain there for all things of the night to behold. And, moreover, though I could nowise have a sure knowledge concerning this matter, Yet did I hope within me that I should make a sure hiding from the power of the house of silence, did I but go very low among the bushes. But, indeed, it was like enough that naught could give me hiding, yet should I lose no chance unto my safety. And because of this I went backward among the bushes, and ceased to escape out unto the westward. And I found presently that the moss-bushes made but a narrow growth in that path and grew only for a while by the side of the great road, so that I was surely fain to keep nigh to the road that I have the covering of the bushes. And in a while I found the road where the silent ones walk, to bend inward at the north of the house of silence, so that it came right horridly close unto the house, for here the hill on which the house did stand was very abrupt and fell steeply unto the road. And so was that dreadful house stood up there above me in the silence, as that it did seem to brood there upon the land. And this side did seem truly as the other, and the equal lone and dreadful. And the house was monstrous and huge, and full of quiet lights. And it was truly as that there had been no sound ever in that house through eternity, but yet was it as that the heart did think each moment to see quiet and shrouded figures within, and yet never were they seen. And this I do but set down that I bring all home unto your hearts also, as that you crouch there with me in those low moss-bushes, there beside the great road, and did look upward unto that monstrous house of everlasting silence, and did feel the utterness of silence to hang about it in the night, and to know in your spirits the quiet threat that lives silent there within. And so shall you have mind of me, hid there among the bushes, and sodden and cold, and yet, as you will perceive, so held in my spirit by an utter terror and loathing and solemn wonder and awe of that mighty house of quietness loomed above me in the night, that I wotted not of the misery of my body, because that my spirit was put so greatly in dread and terror for the life of my being. And also you shall have before you how that I knew in all my body and soul 
that I stood anigh to that place where but a little while gone there had passed inward so dreadful to an everlasting silence and horrid mystery those poor youths. And after that you have minded you of this, you shall consider how that the memory of all my life held dread thoughts of the monstrousness of that house, and now I was anigh unto it. And it did seem to my soul that the very night about it held an anguish of quiet terror, and always my mind did come back to the sheer matter that I was so anigh. And this thing I do say unto you once and again, for truly, as you do see, it hath imprinted itself deep into my spirit, yet shall I now cease from saying further in this manner, for surely you shall never know all that was in mine heart, and if I cease not, I do but be like to weary you. And so did I hide and creep, and oft pause to a time of shaking quiet, and afterward gather something of new courage, and go onward, and peer upward at that monstrous house stood above me in the night. Yet as it did come about I came presently clear of that horrid place, for the road came round again unto the north, and I began that I made a better way through the moss-bushes, but never that I grew too much speed, for I had off to go about that I should miss a naked part here and another there, for truly there was an abundance and bareness of rock, so that the bushes grew not so thick as I could wish. And in the space of five hours was I clear of that house, and did have a greater ease about my heart, but yet was not free to come to food nor to slumber, the both of which I did sorely need. For I had slept neither eat for a weariful time, as you do know. But first I must go further off from the house, and afterwards come to some fire-hole, that I should dry myself and get warmth again into my body, which was bitter cold. And now that I had come unto the northward of the house of silence, there came to me a great wonder, which bred in me a mighty hope and gladness. For as I did go among the bushes, there broke sudden all around me in the ether the low and solemn beat of the master word, and the throb of the word was utter weak so that one moment I did say unto myself that I heard, and in a moment that I did not, yet had I no proper doubt in my heart. And I reasoned with myself, and with a great shaking of excitement and expectation upon me, that the master word came not from the great pyramid, which should have power to send it as a great force across the everlasting night, whilst that this that throbbed about me was faint and scarce to be known even unto the keenness of the night-hearing, which was mine. And immediately, as I crouched low there and thrilled with the hope that was bred in me, lo, there seemed to come the far faint voice of Nani, calling with a little voice within my spirit. And I thought the cry to have an utterness of supplication within it, so that I grew desperate to up and go to running, yet did curb such foolishness, and stayed very hushed to listen. But I heard no more, yet was shaken continually with the joy and hope which this calling did breed in me, for truly did it seem now that I was right that I did determine to go unto the north, for sure was I now that the lesser redoubt lay that way in the night. And it did seem plain unto me that the house of silence had put a barrier between, and had power to withhold so weak a calling. And now I had come beyond the barrier, and I did perceive in my heart how that Nani had called off, maybe in the sadness of despair, yet had the weak crying of her brain elements been held from me by the horrid power of the house, and surely, as I did think, it was well named, for it did make a silence. And so shall you stay with me in your hearts, and take to ourselves something of the new gladness that held all my being, for it did seem truly that my bitter task and adventuring should not in the end be offered to uselessness, and that I did truly draw unto that far place in the everlasting night, where mine own maid did cry for me that I should succor her. And ever as I went did I hark but there was no more the low beating of the master word in the night, not at that time. And presently I spied outward to the west, as it did seem a good mile off in the night, the shining of a fire-hole, 
and I began to plan that I should come unto that place and have warmth and dryness and food and slumber. And in verity, so set was I to the need of these matters that if there did be a monstrous thing nigh to the fire, as was so oft the case, then would I give battle unto it, for neither my joy nor my labours did serve to put warmth into my body, and I must surely come anigh to fire or die. Then, as I kneeled upward among the moss-bushes, and made to lay a true course unto the fire-hole, I perceived that there came a being along the road unto my right, and I went low into the bushes and moved not, for truly I had seen that there drew nigh one of the silent ones. And I made a little place that should let me to see, and I spied out with an utter caution. And lo, the being came on very quiet and with no hurry and in a time it went by me on the road, and did take no heed to me, yet did I feel that it had knowledge that I stooped there among the moss-bushes. And it made no sound as it went, and was a dreadful thing, yet it did seem unto my heart as that it had no trouble of wanton malice to work needless destruction to any. And this I crave strangely that you to understand for it was so to me that I had a quiet and great respect for that thing, and did feel no hatred, yet was very dreadly in fear of it. And it was huge in size, and was shrouded unto its feet, and seemed maybe ten feet high, yet presently it was gone onward down the road, and I was no more troubled by it. Then did I make no waste of time, but set off unto the fire-hole, and kept so much to shelter as I might but was oft made to run over naked places ere that I should come to more of the bushes. And I came presently nigh unto the fire-hole, and made a pause and crept unto it with a great care. And I found it to be in the bottom of a deep hollow of the rock of that part. And the rock was clear looking of all living matters, the which did make me to be glad. And I went round about the top of the hollow, carrying the discos very handily, but there was nowhere any living thing, and I feared not to go downward into the deep hollow and so unto the fire-hole, which lay in the bottom as you have perceived. And when I was come there I made a close search of the rock, and found it was very sweet and warm, and there were no serpents, neither any stinging creatures, so that a certain comfort came upon my spirit. Then stripped I off mine armour and gear, and afterward all my garments, so that I stood naked there in the hollow. Yet was that place almost so warm as some mild oven, and I had no fear to suffer from the cold of the nightland, but was uneasy lest that any monstrous thing should be anigh to come to take me so unawares. Now I wrung the garments and spread them upon the rock near unto the fire-hole, where it was hot, and I did rub my body very brisk with my hands, so that I glowed unto health and had no fear of a stiffness. And afterward I did look to my food and drink, and to the matters in the pouch, but there had no harm come to any, by reason of the tightness of the scrip and the pouch that had kept off the water. And I eat and drank there as I stood waiting for the garments to come to dryness, and I walked about a little as I eat, for I was restless to be into mine armour swiftly and now I did turn this garment upward of the dry side, and now that, but did find them to steam, so that I turned them many times before they were proper. Yet in truth they dried in but a little while, and I gat me into them very swift and into the armour, and I felt the strength and courage of my spirit to come back into me, which had gone outward somewhat when I did stand there so naked. And this feeling you shall all have understanding of, and know that you would have felt that way likewise had you but stood there in that land in so unhappy a plight. And when I had come into mine armour, I put my gear upon me, and took my discos into my hand, and did climb out of the hollow, for I would find a more secure place to my slumber, and did not dare to sleep in that place. For it was beyond seven and thirty hours since that I did have sleep, though, as I do see by my count, I have made it to seem but as five and thirty, yet was a part consumed in diverse matters that I have not set down. And you shall mind how bitter had been my labour and weariness in all that time, and I did know of a surety that sleep must come heavily upon me, 
so that I was sorely in need that I should search out a safe place, for I should not be lightly waked until that I had slept away the tiredness of my heart and the weariful achings from my body. And, indeed, I should mind you how that I was not yet come perfect from the bruising which I had gotten from the fight with the yellow thing. And presently, when I had searched but a little while, I did find that a rock stood upward from a great clumping of the moss-bushes unto my left, and I went over to the rock and made a search about it. And I found that there was a hole into the bottom part of the rock, and I thrust the discos into the hole and made the blade to spin a little, so that it sent out a light. But there was no thing in the hole, and it did seem a dry and safe place for my sleep. Then I turned me about and went into the hole with my feet that way and found that it was so deep into the rock as the length of two men, and just so wide as I could lie in it without having it to pinch me. And there I made my bed in the hole, and went swift into my sleep, and scarce had but a moment even to think upon Nani, and by this thing shall you know how utter was my weariness. Now I waked of a sudden, and was very clear and refreshed, and I crept to the mouth of the hole and looked out, but there was all a quietness round about, and nothing to threaten. And I found that I had slept ten hours, so that I made a haste to eat and drink that I should go forward swiftly upon my journey. And at that time, as in the time when I did eat naked in the hollow by the fire-hole, I eat four of the tablets, and this you shall understand to be rightly due unto me, in that I had gone so long fasting, in that my great journeying to come safe from the hound, and to come past the house of silence. And this shall seem but a little thing to you, yet it was a wondrous important matter unto me, that had gone so long with an empty belly, and was never satisfied. And neither should any be, that had eat so little as I did eat, and made to fill their belly always with a drink of water. Yet I doubt not but that it did keep my soul sweet and wholesome, and no useful thing to the powers of evil of the land. And when I had made an end of so great a gorging, and had ceased to be drunken with water, I got my gear upon me, and took the discos into mine hand, and so went forth once more towards the north. And presently I was nigh unto the road again, for it did curve something westward a space beyond and I was sore tempted to go upon the road, for the ground was rough and the moss-bushes did catch my feet. Yet did I stay among the bushes, though the road was true and smooth by compare. And by this telling you will perceive that I walked once more upright, and had given over to crawl between the bushes. And in truth this was so. For the land did seem very quiet in all that part, and I had less of fear now that I stood beyond the horrid unease of the house of silence. Now after that I had journeyed twelve hours, I saw that I was come upon the commencement of a great and mighty slope, as that the world did slope downward always towards the north. And I went on again, after that I had eaten and drunk, as I did likewise before this at the sixth hour of that day's journey. And presently I perceived the road to cease and surely this did confound me, as that a man of this age had come to a part where the world did end. For you shall know that the road was that which had seemed to go on for ever, and you shall mind the way of my life up till that time, and so shall you the better conceive of my bewilderment, and as it were a feeling of great strangeness unto one that was overpressed, as you would believe, with strange matters. Yet truly was this all as the little book of metal had told unto me, and so should I have been something prepared. Yet are we ever thus needing eye-proof, and perhaps it is more proper that it be so. Yet you shall perceive me adrift somewhat as to direction. For I had steered before this time so that I should come to the north of the house of silence, and afterward had shaped my way by the road. But now was I adrift, as it might be set down, in the wilderness." And so did I stand and consider, and presently did look unto the far pyramid, which was now a great way off in the night, and had seemed but small by that which I knew it to be. And, lo, as I did look, I perceived that I could but see the high upper point of the light of the great pyramid, where did shine the last light. And I was confounded afresh, yet in a moment 
I saw that the greatness of the slope did account for this. But here I should tell to you that the slope was no wise steep, but did seem as that it should never cease, and mayhaps this is clear unto you. And I perceived surely that the time was come when I should make an utter parting from the great redoubt, and the thought came very heavy upon me. And in the same time I knew that the ether was stirred by the emotions of the millions, so that I had knowledge they watched me with the great spy-glass, and did send word down unto the hour-slips, and by this did the millions know and have a great thinking upon me in that moment. And you shall perceive how utter lost and lonesome I did feel. And it was at that time that I did test the compass to comfort me, as I did tell before this, and feared I must sure forget, when I did come to the proper place. Yet have I minded me, as I did desire. And I saw now that the nightland that I did wot of was hid from me by the slope, and I turned and looked down the slope, and surely all before me was utter wildness of a dark desolation. For it did seem to go no whither but into an everlasting night, and there was no fire down there, neither light of any kind, but only darkness, and, as I did feel, eternity. And downward into that blackness did the great slope seem to go forever. Now as I did stand there, looking downward into the dark, and often backward unto the shining of the final light, and put to a horrid desolateness, behold, there came the low beating of the master-word in the night, and it did appear as that it had been sent to give me courage and strength in that moment, and did seem unto my fancy that surely it did come upward unto me from out of the mighty blackness into which the great slope ran. Yet could this have been but a belief, for the ether doth have no regard into direction to show you whence the spiritual sound doth come, and this did my knowledge and reason know full well. And I made that I would send back the master-word, sending it with my brain elements, and so give news unto Nani how that I did struggle to come unto her. Yet did I have caution in time, for in verity had I sent the master-word, then had the evil forces of the land wotted that I was out, and mayhaps had come swift unto my destruction, and so did I contain my spirit and desire, and made to do wisely. Yet was I put in courage by the low beat of the master-word, and did listen very keen, that some message should follow. But there came none, neither did the weak throb of the word come about me again at that time. And because that I was now grown more to my natural state, and did feel that I should indeed find the maid, I looked once more into the great pyramid, long and eager and with a solemn heart yet with no sign or salutation, as I was before determined. And afterward I turned and went downward into the dark. End of chapter 7, part 3